Hello and welcome to the inaugural episode of the MooCast. We are gamers just like you and hopefully this will become your destination for some fun uh, gaming related conversation goodness. Uh, my name is Mike O'Mara. I'm Greg Obert. I'm Andrea Musa. And uh, we are members of the Moo Clan. Uh, we are going to start our inaugural episode talking about a game that's gotten tons and tons of controversy this last month. Of course, we are talking about Mass Effect 3, and really the whole series. And if I could just uh, begin by saying I love you, Bioware, and no matter what you do with the upcoming <laughs> closing DVD, I will still love you. Your game is incredible for 99.998% of the time. I don't know what the F is up with that ending. The rest of it <laughs> ruled, though. Greg, what do you feel about Mass Effect 3? Oh, Mass Effect 3 is probably my favorite in terms of gameplay and set-piece moments in the entire series. I loved jumping around all the different locations. I did not love that ending. Uh, I just I sat there, and I just didn't really have any feelings whatsoever. And then when I kind of went back and rewatched the endings, right. I just... I was like, it just shook my head and kind of like, no, that that really doesn't work for me. Right, um, right. Now we should we should say that since this is since well, one of our members, uh, Andrea here, has not finished the game, uh, we are not going to. This will not be a spoiler cast. Uh, we'll, Greg and I are, are just uh, crying and still licking our wounds after <laughs> after finishing the game in the last couple of weeks. But Andrea here is still on uh, on uh, the second uh, episode of the series, Mass Effect Two. And uh, since you just played through the first one, uh, Andrea, and are just now into the second one, uh, I, I should ask you what do you feel about the difference in gameplay? Because I know that when I played one and then jumped to two, it, it was huge for me because one to me felt more like a um, it's not like it moved slower. I guess it moved a little bit slower to me. It felt it felt like more of a standard RPG, more turn-based uh, kind of action, whereas 2 is like gung-ho in your face. So I, I guess we should, we should ask you how you felt about that, being kind of new to that change in yeah, the series. Yeah, um, I definitely noticed a big difference between the first one and the second one. Mm -hmm. The second one is, I think, more about the combat, and I just recently started playing um, the Mass Effect 3 multiplayer. I sure. haven't started the campaign, right. just, the, just the multiplayer. And I'm getting used to it because now I'm playing more of the second one, mm -hmm. which I think is helping. But they're yeah, they're very different combat wise. What do you do? You find that you prefer the second one, like the quicker movement, or are you so like used to the first one that you you wish that they would go back to that? No, I like the second one yeah. better. Plus, yeah. as a bonus, I feel like I'm dying a lot less. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Really? Now, did you play through one on normal or... Normal, yeah. On normal, and the mm -hmm. second one the same way? Mm-hmm. And you feel like it's like it, they toned it down a little bit? I think so. No. I mean, I, mean, I think that they, they made it more streamlined, which I guess turned some people off, but I mean, I just, I, I can't, personally, I can't get enough of this series, and... I am uh, so hoping that they continue to make games in this galaxy, in this universe, because I am, like, obsessed. I'm a complete fanboy. I have, like, the, the two coffee table books and, of course, all the games and, like, stickers. And I should say that I'm a 32-year-old man. So that, <laughs> so, 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 that is, so that is a bit pathetic. But uh, I, I don't know. Like, what is it about this series? Like, why do people – why are people so rabid about this ending – uh, you know, in relation to the whole story, like, what is it that sucks people in? Because, you know, like, honestly, I know we all play Call of Duty and we all play other games like that. Like, who oh, cares? Who, yeah, but who cares how, how Call of Duty campaign ends? You know what I mean? Like, if everyone blows up, like, great. If if people have a teary, like, goodbye, great. Like, no one's going to go to the internet and start a retake Call of Duty campaign. Uh, you know, but for this, like, they are sucked in. And these are not just, you know, your typical trolling 14 year olds like these are like 30 and 40 year old grown people saying like give me my game universe back what is it you know what is it i think it's just this series for me being a console gamer i never really played a ton of pc mm -hmm. stuff but just on the console growing up i never had any kind of epic storytelling event and mm -hmm. i feel like the three games that are mass effect are just an event like it's not just one particular point. No, this has been happening since 2007. Right, right. And the story that's just unfolded, I mean, Bioware, probably in my opinion, uh, right. the best studio in terms of writing. Right. Um, and, you know, to take you on this epic journey and have all the set piece moments that you've had in all three of the games, right. and then to just kind of end the way it does. <laughs> it was just a big letdown. You're still sore. You're still sore. I can see it. Uh, yeah, a little bit. A little yeah, bit. yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, for you, Andrea, what's it? What's the like? What's the favorite part of like the whole universe? Not just in particular um, one game, but for me, it's it's how the story connects with all of it. At least for me, because I'm playing as the femme chef. It's right, like, right. You know, the cuter, thinner version of myself. <laughs> so it's it's almost like you know I'm the hero of the story. So absolutely. Um, you know, instead of playing as you know random Call of Duty dude with gun, you right, know, right. it's like, it's me, in a way, it totally so is, that yeah. makes it more fun. Right, right, absolutely, and you can't go wrong with space powers, right, like, you can't go oh, wrong yeah. with, with magic that they somehow, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, encapsulate in, in some sci-fi mumbo-jumbo that none of us really care about, it's really just magic and force powers, let's just admit it. It is, it is, I, I've heard, you know, a game journalist before say it's this generation Star Wars, and I really can't find any reason to, to discount that statement. I mean, would you guys agree? I think what Mass Effect does in that, you know, in that sense is definitely true. Um, I mean, it just set up this epic universe in one, just expanded upon it in two, and I think really resolved so much in three, um, and did a fantastic job all the way through, mm -hmm. and I mean, I feel like that's what Star Wars was, you know, for right. moviegoers. Right, so. right, and I think the proof is in the pudding with how crazy people are actually going about this ending. Like, obviously, people are more invested than, you know, the next Mario game. Like, no one cares yeah. what happens to Luigi. Like, sorry, Luigi, but... <laughs> I'm really invested in that. Well, maybe you are. <laughs> maybe you are. I care about what happens to Toad, but, like, not not nearly as much as, I kept, uh, as what happens to my shepherd. So, uh, yeah, I mean... I, I don't know. I just I don't know if there will be another another series like that. It seems like they put so much into it that they they almost set themselves up to fail, and it's actually incredible that they didn't fail up until the very end of the ending thing. And we still don't know if it's a failure. But of course, we can't talk about the theories. I know, of I'm so <laughs> we can't talk about. It. We don't really know. But it, you know, I am hoping. I'm hoping that what what we're all thinking is what it's going to be. But. Uh, let's let's transition a little bit and talk about the multiplayer because Mass Effect Three was the first time in the series that they introduced multiplayer, and instead of doing like a you know I'm going to be human on the human team and you're on the Krogan team and we're going to like kill each other in third person combat a la Gears of War or something like that, instead they decided to go purely co-op with fire bases that are that are based on missions from the single player. Um, which I actually really like. Um, they were, you know, people were doing the usual griping before it came out that that this will water down the series and it won't be as serious enough, and somehow it'll take away from the story. BS. Like I played so many hours of story. The story was fantastic. Don't worry about that. If you haven't gotten the game yet, trust me, get two copies uh, so you can keep one in mint, mint condition for your grandkids someday. It's really that good. But. Um, the multiplayer, what what does kind of get me, and I'm still, you know, I've played a lot of the multiplayer, but what still kind of gets me is this trading card aspect of it. Like, in most shooters these days, you have to earn, you know, you earn XP or whatever. You earn experience points, you earn money, whatever the system is in the game. And then you kind of choose what weapons you're going to upgrade. You know, you can earn new weapons by different levels, but you choose which ones you're going to put attachments on or buy, attachments for, things like that. And in Mass Effect 3... Uh, basically, it's all based on, on the credit in-game credit system, and then you buy these packs, and then sometimes you'll get what you want, and then sometimes, well, for me, all the time, you'll get something you don't want, and it'll power up a gun that you totally, totally hate. Now, I'm kind of on the fence of this. I don't know if I hate it or if I love it, and it's actually like there's no middle ground for me right now. I'm trying to decide whether it's kind of cool, like a trading card game, because it kind of has that, that vibe to it. Uh, of like baseball cards when I was a little kid. Like you, you get a baseball card, sometimes you get the player you really wanted, and 97% of the time you spent all your allowance on crappy guys that you hated from like the Kansas City Royals or something like that. You know, so I, I'm kind of on the fence. And I, I know since both of you have played, played the multiplayer part of Mass Effect 3 as well, uh, I, I'd like to hear what your thoughts on that are. And, and, and do you think you'll keep playing it? Like this is another thing that people were saying is, Will it really have a community once people are done with the game? Because most people were using it to, to jack up their galaxy at war, or whatever that's called. Readiness meter. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, and, and, you know, do you think a community will, will st stick around a multiplayer Mass Effect universe? Greg? I think it depends on how much support Bioware gives. Like, for those of you that have played Red Dead Redemption co-op, mm. you know, for me, I thought those were some fantastic missions. And that's the thing. They were missions. It right. wasn't just firefight. Right, right, right. Um, or survival. Right. Whatever game you come from. But um, right now, Mass Effect 3 is just firefight. And right. there needs to be more to it than that. 
Right. Um, I don't think the trading card aspect is going to keep people hooked. Cause right. Especially because you can't trade with anyone. It's right. Kind of, here, put all your money into this. So, for example, this week they have like a super premium Spectre pack, which right, is right. 99,000 credits. Right. You get about 15,000 credits per game if you're on the lowest difficulty. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I played for a while to get all the money. And I bought this pack, and it was a complete waste. Mm -hmm. Like, I got absolutely nothing <laughs> that I wanted. And it's so frustrating New because then I have to start all the way from scratch. Right, 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 right. Andrea, what do you think about the multiplayer? you liking it? Um, yes and no. Hmm. I It's it's different. Mm -hmm. I mean, I like the firefight. I like the, the co-op aspect of mm -hmm. it. I'm still getting used to it. I feel like, well, I'm still like a really low level. I'm still trying to figure out how it works. Right. But I think what puts me at a disadvantage is that I don't have these good weapons because I don't have the credits and Absolutely. it's all random. Yeah. So my score is always so pathetic compared to right. everyone else right. on my team. Right. Um, so the random weapons, I don't like it, but maybe that's because I'm not used to it because I've never played a game. Absolutely, before. yeah. Yeah. So I'm still trying to keep an open mind and right, right. play it some more. So, you know, this would be an interesting discussion. Is, is what, what could they add to make that worth it? You know, because, I mean, like it or not, I mean, other great games are going to come out this year. And also, you know, once everyone does finish the game, like finish the main part of the game, the single player, it's going to be hard to keep people coming back to that universe when they have other games that are so fleshed out and so built for multiplayer. Like, people will go back to Battlefield 3, they'll go back to, to Call of Duty, they'll go back to all those games. So, what could keep you coming back uh, to the Mass Effect universe in a multiplayer sense? Well, for me, it needs to be some kind of story element. I mean, Bioware, that's their strength. So, yeah, they yeah. play to that and... You know, like I mentioned with Red Dead, have some kind of mission structure uh -huh. where it's not just wave after wave of enemies. Fe make the player feel like they're working towards some kind of goal and accomplishing something. Because, oh, that'd be so cool. Yeah, I, I mean, like if that. you're just killing waves of husks over and over again, eventually... <laughs> while fun! While fun. Very fun. <laughs> it's going to get old after a while. I guess it does get old, yeah. Some way, any way that they could in, in, in put some story in it would be the coolest thing ever. I think I agree with you. Also, the other the other news has, co has come out recently that, that uh, Bioware might be trying to make it into an MMO. Now, would you pay to be in the Mass Effect <laughs> universe monthly, Andrea? Um, that's a good question. Uh, if the way if multiplayer is the way it is now, mm -hmm. I think I'd say no. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, with Mass Effect, at least, you know, I'm still progressing through the story, and I think I'm about halfway through the second mm -hmm. game. When I think Mass Effect, I think the single-player story. I don't really think multiplayer yet. Right. Um... Possibly. I think it would depend really what they did with it. If there were like raids on different planets, like a World of Warcraft thing, but in space and it looked like Mass Effect, <laughs> I might be on board with that. I have to say, like, I, I always do this to myself. I always overcommit uh, in, in gaming. Uh, I always say that I'll have time for that and I never have time for an MMO. But, I mean, if it were Mass Effect, I think I might do it. I don't know. It might, it, the space powers and the guns <laughs> and the Asari women might draw me in. <laughs> What are you thinking, Greg? I'm thinking absolutely not. Really? Uh, really. Interesting coming I, from you. And I mean, I love this series, but just something about, and this is just me, my own personal thing, something about paying for a game month by month. Turns you off. me Because not only do I have to pay for the game right. and any sort of DLC or expansions right. that come out, now I have to pay for the privilege to play the to game. To keep playing the game. Month. And it's like, especially with games like Lord of the Rings and mm -hmm. all these other MMOs kind yeah. of going free to play and right. just making a ton of money. Right. I don't think we're going to see it being a paid thing. Right. Um, to, to be honest, I'm surprised uh, Knights of the, or the Old Republic is right. uh, pay right now. Right. What if, they, what if they did that, though? What if they went, what if they basically made it microtransactions? So what if they sort of did what they're doing with the, with the multiplayer now so that you have two options? You can either gain experience the normal, old-fashioned, grindy way, or you can pay tiny little amounts of Microsoft points to get big bonuses right away. Would you be on board with that? If it was just by the game and then microtransactions kind of fuel the extra guns and things like that, would you do that? I mean, for me, microtransactions are very tricky and... It's a slippery it, slope, to be it, sure. It depends on what you're actually going to be getting. I mean, if, if you're going to spend money on the game, you know, and get extra experience, something mm -hmm. that you could get normally, mm -hmm. just maybe get it faster, mm -hmm. that's totally fine. I'm right. okay with that. But right. if it's like... You need to pay for equipment that's actually usable. 
then that's a problem for me. Right, right. Andrea, would you be on board? I still don't know. I know I'm really indecisive. Um, you are not a true fan. <laughs> Both of you, get off this podcast. <laughs> Um, I feel like I'm, I'm more inclined to, to agree with Greg just mm -hmm. because you're already investing so much time and money mm -hmm. and then it's like, oh, well, here's some more stuff. Pay for more stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not down know. with paying for more stuff, no, eh? No, not really. Hmm. Especially because everything adds up, you know, like Greg said, the game DLC, you know, you're paying a yearly fee to right. play on Xbox. Right. Like, Ugh. Too much for your blood, eh? Yeah. <laughs> that's the time we're going to get all those comments from the PS3. It's just like, oh, there's the PlayStation Network. It's free. Oh, but, yeah. Right, true. right, right. Right. Except no one plays on it. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. That was Mike. Yeah, so Mike sorry. Comments from sorry Mike. about that, Sony fanboys. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, we'll, we'll table some of the Mass, Dis uh, Mass Effect discussion until our friend Andrea here gets to uh, the end of the third game, and then we'll have a complete spoiler yeah, cast where, we'll, where we will argue, <laughs> argue over the relative merits for 45 minutes. But for now, let's kind of transition out of sci-fi and kind of think about RPGs as a whole. Really, the past uh, couple of months for me have been dominated by two RPGs. The, the Mass Effect that we've already talked about and Skyrim. <laughs> Skyrim is friggin' awesome. And if anyone out there has been living under a rock and has not played this game, you must play this game. I live under a rock. That being said, I these two. <laughs> these, that being said, these two people here <laughs> apparently. However, I have my reasons because I played Oblivion. Yes. And thing sucked my life away. So right. I know oh. as soon as I put Skyrim into my disc tray, that's, I'll just say goodbye to the world. That's it. There's no way. Yeah, you're not coming up for air for another 105 hours. So, <laughs> I interesting. Uh, there's an interesting stat that came out last week from uh, straight from the source from Bethesda. And they said that the average playtime on an average person's uh, save as of uh, last week was 85 hours of game time. So, of course, I was like, oh, surely I'm not that much of a nerd, and I booted mine up. I'm almost there. I've got about 70 hours. Now, here's the disgusting thing. In my household, I have a, a wife who also games, uh, but only games like Oblivion and Skyrim. So she's only really into the into the open world stuff. She doesn't really play shooters. She doesn't really care for the more linear games. She likes things where she can just explore. She already has 66 hours on hers, and she considers herself a casual gamer. So that really got me to thinking, like, what is it about these wide open, do anything worlds that suck people in for that long? It's almost like a drug. It really is. Like you don't know how bad you've got it until you turn it off and it's 4.30 in the morning and you've been playing again for another 10 straight hours. So since you two haven't delved into the Skyrims, um, I guess I'll table that for now. But I want to ask you two the, 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 this kind of question. Like what has been the game for you that has done that for you? Or like you, like day after day, week after week, you realize, oh my god, I stayed up too late, or oh my god, I should have gotten something done with my day off instead of play this game. Yeah. And then you turn it off and it's like three in the morning, and you're like, oh, I gotta get to work in, in three and a half hours. Like, what has been that game for you, and why do you think it sucked you in so hardcore? So let's go, Andrea, first. Oh, well, I'd have to say probably the first one, Call of Duty, right. Modern Warfare 2. Right. That was the game that, that finally made me decide to get the Xbox. Right. I, just, I saw it. I, I tried it, couldn't play it. I uh, I'm ashamed to admit it, but I used the the noob tube. Oh no! <laughs> to get some kills, it was the only way. But um, I just I don't know what it was. I just I saw this game and I was like, oh my god, I have to have it. The same thing happened with Guitar Hero, but that's another <laughs> story. Um, and it was just love at first sight. Yeah, it really was. I can't describe it more than that. And how many hours would you say you've put into Call of Duty? <laughs> at approximate. My uh, my Call of Duty uh, Modern Warfare 2 gameplay time is, oh god, this makes me sound so sad and so <laughs> pathetic, it's like 16 days. 16 days? Yeah. And she's still single, gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Now, what, what do you think is it for you? Like, after, after, the, after the initial, like, look at those beautiful guns and the beautiful gameplay and the silky smooth reaction time on my controller. Like, after, after the honeymoon is over, Andrea, what kept you coming back for 16 straight days of Modern Warfare 2? Um, I really liked the, the leveling up and um, just doing all the challenges to unlock the pretty little pictures. Ah, there you go. Um, I only prestige once, and then I thought, well, you know, everything's going to reset. I kind of right. wanted to keep everything there. Right. But I really liked... 
uh, yeah, just getting the pictures. I like, you know, you have that page of all right. the emblems and right. stuff. It's like, I want to complete the page. Right, so it's the idea of even though it's completely fake and not real at all, I mean, they're just pictures on a screen. It's some kind of like instant gratification. It's some kind of like trophy that you can work towards that you know that eventually you'll get on your wall and then other people won't have it. It's It's some kind of like... I don't know, what is it? What is it? Is it some kind of like, uh, you feel better than other people? Is it some kind of like entitlement? Like, what is it? I don't know. I just, um, I guess it's almost like going above and beyond. Like, I, mm. now when I look back, I used to have a PS2. It's like playing video games without achievements. Like, <gasps> right. scandalous. How <laughs> right. did I do it? But, um, like, for example, um, Siphon Filter 2, one mm -hmm. of my all-time favorite games, mm -hmm. I'd go through it and, you know, there are... Um, you could go through it on hard mode mm -hmm. and, you know, find, I don't know, uh, just the certain unlocks, mm -hmm. like to unlock, uh, you find hidden things to unlock multiplayer maps. Sure. So it was just, I guess it comes down to collecting everything in the end and just to have everything there. Right. Going now, above and beyond. <laughs> now we should, we should admit here, uh, Andrea and Greg are, are achievement whores. Let's do that's, that's <laughs> No, the, Greg's the number one. Well, he's, he's, he's number one, but you, you are, you are a protege of Mr. Greg here. And I must admit that I, I really could care less. Um, but, but there is an interesting kind of nerd dynamic that goes on in my brain when I see other achievement scores of people that are on my friends list that are like a million times more than me and it is some kind of weird like nerdy version of like achievement jealousy and I must admit that I feel it sometimes and it makes absolutely no sense <laughs> and when it comes down to it I really don't have the drive to go after achievements I just want to play more games like I can't replay the same game if I'm already bored with it just to get those those extra points on the board so I don't understand what it is about achievements but um, you know, for me, um, like I was saying, it was it was it was it's been Skyrim, the Mass Effect of the last couple of months, and what really sucked uh, me into Skyrim particularly was just the fact that everything was open from the get go. So, if you wanted to get lost, just climbing up mountains and looking off the side and taking screenshots and posting them to YouTube, people have done that for days just to find the best. Really? Just to, yes, just to find oh, the best, cool. just to find the best scenery. If you wanted to become a fake farmer and you want to go like find some farmland and you want to take uh, a shovel and dig in the ground and like get cabbages and sell them at market, you can do that. Now, does it have anything to do with the storyline? No. Is it cool? Not really. But like the <laughs> fact that you can do that, just the fact that you can kind of makes me want to, like at least a little bit. Like what would it be like to become a blacksmith? Like. I, I don't know, like, do I care about them in real life? Not at all, but for some reason in this world, like, I can just, like, do anything, and it's like pure escapism, where it's a completely realized and living world that is not real, it's something that does not have my job deadlines, does not have the people I have to work with every day, it just, <laughs> it just, it's a different life, and that's what it is for me, and I think that's what got me in Mass Effect too so much. Uh, was that that I could follow my shepherd through these different through these different all these years over all these stories and and it, it was like it was me but totally not me and that's what gets me about those games. What about for you, Greg? Like, what's been a game that's really sucked you in? Oh my gosh. Well, I think probably in terms of like multiplayer and just having fun with, with friends. Right. I'd say the original Halo. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. oh my gosh. Be still my heart. Oh, <laughs> me too. But. Uh, I've been in love with Halo since 2001, yeah. and I just play the heck out of it. I mean, Andrea's got 16 days on Modern Warfare yeah. 2. I may or may not have over 18 days in Halo Reach. Oh, <laughs> my God. <laughs> but uh, And what is it about that? Like, what is it about Halo particularly? You know, I just... And I know there's going to be so many comments about, sure. like, ah... But for me, Halo is a very balanced game. Sure. Uh, I love Modern Warfare 3. I think sure. it's a lot of fun, but... I'm sorry, that spawn system is broken. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it is. you know, like, Halo, you don't see that too much, or as much. Right. And, uh, I don't know, I just feel like they're very solid games. Right, right. They just, is there something that is, that is uh, a very visceral experience when a game just absolutely feels right? Mm -hmm. Like, when the, when the guns in the game feel like they have weight, even though, obviously... They don't have weight. You're not holding anything. You're holding a controller. But like when it when the sound effects are spot on and the sound effects go really well with the animation, the animation is just crisp and clean. And exactly when you put the input in, there is something that really makes it feel like another appendage, like it's part of you. Mm -hmm. And it's so important for a shooter to feel that way. And I think that that Halo has done that, like nailed that on the head for so many people. They're like it just feels 
Right. But how do you know how it feels to be a, like a 700 pound cyborg? Like, <laughs> like who knows? But like, for whatever reason, like, I guess when we all become 700 pound cyborgs in the future, that's how it'll feel. But well, and I think that's the difference between things like Halo and Call of Duty, because, you know, Call of Duty is fun, but let's be honest, the development time on those things, I mean, they have two years. Right. If that. To right. Get they that have to crank them out. out. Yeah. Whereas Halo, you know, you have two, three, four years to get the thing out. They have a public beta so they can squash a lot of the bugs. And, right, right, right. You know, so I think when you get the finished copy, Halo, for me at least, feels like a more complete game. Right. Or something like Call of Duty. For those of you that know, like Type 95, you know. Yeah, uh, Type 95! Dual uh, FMGs. Yeah. Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> well, in the campaign, too, in Call of Duty, like, it, it really doesn't exist. I mean, right. I, I play Call of Duty for the multiplayer. You so know, does everyone, campaign. I think, at this point. Yeah, I mean, you know, the campaign was just a bonus, but right. it's all about the multiplayer. See, the thing is, though, Call of Duty 4 had a fantastic campaign. It did. It did. I, I loved it. I loved that. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I jumped over that first chasm in a snowmobile, right. in Modern and Warfare I jumped too, the shark, I'm like, <laughs> nope. That's it. Right, that's it. Forget reality. <laughs> yeah, let's let's get back into domination mode. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I, well, oh, since we're on uh, Halo for a second here, so Halo Four, lots of news is coming out. Uh, they have they have uh, announced uh, Halo Infinity, which is what they're calling the multiplayer now. So apparently now you're not going to roll into uh, a match and run around the maps anymore to find the best weapons. You're going to be able to choose your loadout. So it's much more like Battlefield Three or like uh, like Call of Duty. Um, it doesn't affect me so much as I think these two because uh, because they play a lot more Halo than I do. Although to be sure, I'll be there at midnight picking it up with them. Uh, but but Greg, I, I guess you're the most hardcore Halo player here. Like, what do you think about this uh, proposed change to kind of like attachments and loadouts versus like run around the map, find the rocket launcher, kill everyone? I mean, it depends on how it's handled. Like, for me, I, I think back to Reach, and that had loadouts, mm -hmm. you know, especially if you played Invasion, you, know, mm -hmm. you could choose Sword, whatever right. you started with. Right. And that, to me, felt balanced. Like, I didn't right. feel like it was broken. Mm -hmm. So I guess for me, you know, again, calling back to the Type 95, I don't want a gun like that in Halo 4, where sure. it's just... This is the super gun, and right. if you pick anything else, you're pretty much just being an idiot. Right, 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 right. So, I mean, it could work. I, I have faith in 343. Right, right, um, right. I think they understand the stakes of uh, right. what and, they have. Right, so. right. Another, um, another uh, story announcement about Halo 4 that just came out a couple days ago was that the Covenant are actually back. They said that the Covenant are attacking uh, uh, John uh, Spartan 117's uh, ship in the trailer that they that they uh, came out with uh, early, uh, last year. Uh, what do we what do we feel about the the covenant at least being back in in some way? Did we all kind of hope that it was completely something different or in the back of our minds do we always just love shooting the cubbies? Andrea? Oh, I like shooting the cubbies. <laughs> How could you not? <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> How could I you not? Feel like, well, um, I played the Halo games out of order. Mm -hmm. So, Halo 3 was like my Halo 1. Yeah. Um, I still haven't played the second one, but, uh, I, <laughs> um... You will forever miss the multiplayer. It oh was yeah, grand. So grand. Um, I like the idea of bringing back something that's familiar. It's like the Covenant, Halo. Right, like, they kind of fit. It seems wrong right. without it. Right, right. Greg? Uh, I uh, actually haven't heard that, but my initial reaction is no. 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 I don't like that. Yeah. Um, and it's not that I hate the Covenant. I mean, the elites in Halo 1, just the death noises awesome. they make, yeah. is hilarious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, shooting grunts never gets old. Never gets old. But, uh, I don't know. I guess I just hope for something new. I mean, you know, Bungie told its story with Halo 1, 2, and 3, and, you know, you had your prequel mm -hmm. with Reach. Um, but I was hoping for just something completely new, and, you know, maybe a couple throwbacks here or there. If that's what they're talking about, then cool. Right. But I feel like the human covenant war was pretty much wrapped, wrapped up, up at the end of yeah. three. I mean, yeah. at least that was my feel. But then again, we thought that, uh, that John was wrapped up too. And now suddenly he's back yeah, and Cortana's yeah. back and everyone's back. I, I mean, I think in some ways they're so big at this point that whatever they do, they're going to be damned if they do and damned if they don't. Like if they said, this is a new Spartan story, like everyone would be, what, what happened to John? What's ever changed? <laughs> you know, if they don't bring back Cortana, like every fanboy in the world will cry tears of blood, you know, but, <laughs> 
<laughs> so I think they have to. They had to bring him back. They had to bring her back. Do they have to bring back the Covenant? I don't know. And maybe it's just a prelude. They have actually haven't announced that the Covenant are the main evil force. They just said that the Covenant are there and the Covenant are attacking him. So it's been confirmed that they're in game, but mm. they're not the game. We don't know that yet. Um, in that case, I hope they're not no. then. I feel like there should be a new threat. Now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. What are your thoughts on a return of the flood? Oh. If, if the flood is return, I'd actually, I'd actually love it. I think the really? I, the I think the flood are freaky and and uh, and horrifying, and I think that it makes the game it makes the single player more tense because like you get used to the the patterns of all the of all the covenant like they it's pretty established that like they are I mean yes they're alien yes they want to kill you but they're also like a civilized. Uh, I put that in quotes, like military, like they all have ways that they fight, you know, but then the flood are just horrifying and come out of everywhere and like rush you. And uh, I don't know, to me, it makes it more tense, which to me makes for a better shooting experience, especially in co-op. It's like awesome to like roll on those guys and just go shotguns crazy with like a thousand flood coming after you. So if the flood come back or if the way that they implement the flood really makes for different kind of gameplay variations, then I am then I am all for it. I love the flood. They they freak me out. But then again, I'm a huge zombie fan, so anything that zombifies like humans is a okay, okay and a okay in my book. But Andrea, you said you weren't looking forward to that. No, I hated the flood. They're my least favorite enemy in the game. Why? Because they're scary. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they're terrifying. I mean, they are no. terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> um. I just those levels, and I'm thinking of the library. Oh, oh, but that's because you don't like the library. The library. No one likes the library. Okay, the flood in general. No, I still I hated them. I was like, give me elites, give me grunts, anything with the flood. Hmm. You don't like them because they because they rush you. They you don't like them because they look funny. <laughs> they certainly look funny. <laughs> funny. Well, they do. They look like potted plants yeah. on top of the human. There's like stalks <laughs> and things coming out of everywhere. Now I'm gonna think of that the next time I play. It's Halo. true. Um, I just <laughs> not your favorite, eh? No, I just hate yeah. yeah. Okay, well let's try. Let's transition. We've been talking about uh, a couple of big games, and uh, let's talk a little bit about ourselves. Since this is the this is the first uh, of our of our podcast, uh, we'd like to introduce ourselves to our audience. So uh, uh, I think we're going to go around and talk a little bit about our personal gaming history. So let's take a, a trip down memory lane for a second here. And Andrea, if you'd uh, like to go first, go ahead. Okay. Um, I guess, well, a question I have is, what was the first gaming console you had? The first gaming console <laughs> I had um, that plays real games or that played anything? Like, that plays anything, things... Anything. Oh, my God. Um... <laughs> Well, I have a, I have a, a, a tragedy, a, a little bit of a personal tragedy to oh, share wow. with all of you. I wish we had a solo violin going on right now. It would make it a lot more appropriate. But the farthest back I can remember in gaming, my dad had some kind of computer-ish system that he plugged into the TV. But it had a tape, like a tape drive, like a cassette tape looking thing. This must have been... 1981 or something like that. And I remember that he had to preload it for about like four hours off the tape before he could even play it. Oh my gosh. And I don't even know what it was. I have to like go on some website and find out what the system was because it wasn't quite video games yet, but it wasn't it wasn't a full computer. It was like something that was meant to play these adventure games. And they were like um, text-based like games. So it would like load it on the TV, and it must have been some kind of early Atari with a with a tape like accessory or something. I have no idea at this point, but that's my earliest memory of games. But then my parents like shut it down. They decided once I got like to about four or five that video games were the devil, and that was it. So I actually I I I, I went through the whole NES generation of America, like going Gaga over Donkey Kong and Metroid and Zelda and Mario. Like I missed all of that. Like I saw that all through the lens of my cousins who had all of it, and my you know my friends whenever I'd go over to their houses or things like that. But my parents like forbade it. So like I did not have anything like that. And the first system I I really remember having is the Sega Genesis. Um, so by that time, I guess they decided my brain was already rotted enough by like MTV or whatever else was around. So they might as well, you know, someone they might as well let the, you know my uncle get me a game system for Christmas. So I think that he got me uh, 
like Genesis, uh, when that shortly after that came out, and that that was like the first thing, and then like immediately, of course, like I was hooked, absolutely friggin' hooked. Like I played Altered Beast like for a million hours, and that game <laughs> stinks. But but uh, welcome to your doom. Right, 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 <laughs> right, right. So I yeah, I remember playing Altered Beast. I remember when uh, when Sonic came out, I went absolutely crazy. And uh, I was a Sega fanboy through the uh, Dreamcast. I had a Dreamcast when that came out. And then I got into a PlayStation when that came out. And then I was a PlayStation fanboy through PS2. And then I, I, I went uh, complete Xbox. I went Xbox crazy because they had the um, the realistic military, like, gritty shooters that my, like, that my uh, elder high school slash uh, undergrad uh War gamer in me wanted to play, so like I remember, uh, Ghost Recon One made me get the Xbox original Xbox, and then like once Halo came out, poof, that that was it. That was it. I was an Xbox fan for life, and I got Xbox 360 at launch. Got PS3 a little bit after that. Got a Wii. Now I've just got everything. Now I got a gaming PC and a PS3 and a Wii and an Xbox and a couple of Xboxes, and uh, and that's that's what my that's what my hobby is now. But yeah, it all started with the Sega Genesis for me. Cool. Yeah. Greg, how about you? Well, for me, back in the day, um, <laughs> you know, uh, my parents had got me something similar to what Mike's parents had. It plugged into the TV. Um, my mom said it was a Commodore. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but it had big old floppy disks. Not yeah. like, you know, small. Yeah, like five disc, and like a quarter. Floppy <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> And it had a joystick with one orange button on it. Right. That's and all so, you need. That's all you need. Yeah. So I would play Reader Rabbit. I'd yep. play yep. Rampage. Right, and right. Such a transition. There. Right, right. <laughs> and I'd play Ninja Turtles. Sweet. And Artie the Aardvark was of one of the other ones, <laughs> yeah. which is pretty fun. But uh, the first system that I remember having was the NES. Um, mm -hmm. Which I caught the tail end of it. And because I was so young, right. you know, I didn't play any like Zelda or right. anything like that. Right, right. Um, so actually I didn't play Zelda until Ocarina of Time. That was my first Oh, that's a good game. one to get into. But... Yeah. <laughs> um, but after that, you know, I had Super Nintendo and I to this day that was my favorite system. Mm -hmm. um, Love Super Nintendo. It just had so many amazing games on it. Um, my first RPG I played was Super Mario RPG. Oh, um, good one. Probably one, my favorite game of all time. You know, it's it's a big contender. And, yeah. Um, after that, you know, I ended up getting a Sega for a little bit, mm -hmm. the Genesis, and then I got a PlayStation 1 because my friend had Crash Bandicoot, and I just yeah. loved Crash, Crash Bandicoot because it was so amazing. And then uh, after that, got a PlayStation 2, well, N64, of course, mm -hmm. uh, which had so many great games on it. Um, I, have, I owned a Dreamcast as well. Um, I don't know if you ever got Typing of the Dead. I did. Yes. Awesome. It's the nerdiest Such game a ever. Stupid game. Yeah. It's so amazing. Yep. <laughs> I've never heard of this one. So, this have one. you ever played House of the Dead at the no. arcade or anything? Mm -mm. Well, for those of you that don't know, I.E. Andrea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's the only one that doesn't know. <laughs> um, Sega came out with this shooter's light gun game called House of the Dead. And it was originally only in the arcade. And it was some stupid thing about some guy like resurrecting people and Typical. all these monsters, yeah. and you had to okay. shoot through a mansion or a town to get to this guy. And there was always that stupid stop magician. Yeah, I hated the magician. But anyways, in Dreamcast, they decided to redo the second one, and they called it Typing of the Dead. So instead of a gun, you use a keyboard. <laughs> no and way! Yeah. All of the zombies. <laughs> Had text over yep. them. Oh. And you had to you type, had to type whatever type the them. word was to kill them. It was awesome. It was, it was ridiculous. awesome. <laughs> Only was from this game Japan. Where they were typing. Right. This is so much fun. It's it much was. more badass than Mavis Beacon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there was some. There was some space one. I remember space planets and typing. Oh, and typing. Yeah. 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 It's got yeah. Nothing on zombies. No. It's no. True. It doesn't. Nothing's better than typing your way through zombie <laughs> wasteland. That's perfect. That's perfect. Yeah, Type that was awesome. But after that, I, uh, I had Xbox, GameCube, um, and you know everything since then. I don't currently have a PlayStation 3. My brother does. So <gasps> I play that. I want one. I really do. You should get My one. brother has it, so I play some of the big titles that come out whenever mm -hmm. I, when I'm at home. I think God of War 3 was the last big one that I went through on it. Um, well, that's kind of my history right now. I play a lot of, a lot of 360, and I think my next endeavor is to uh, play Skyward Sword. Oh. You need to get that stupid motion plus. Thing. Right, right, yeah. right, right. But uh, yeah, that's going to be my next big game. Right. So, Andrea, yeah. what about you? Um, for me, I remember my first game console was the Sega Genesis. Mm -hmm. 
And um, at the time, I was obsessed with Sonic. I still have my little stuffed animal in my comic books. But <laughs> Were you there on Sonic Tuesday? Do you remember Sonic Tuesday? No, I don't remember that. That's when Sonic 2 came out. It was like 2 2 92 or something like that. Or how young were you? Were you even well, how young were you? <laughs> 4. So you weren't there on Sonic Tuesday. No. I was there on Sonic Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> um that yeah, that's really cool. But uh yeah, so with Sonic and I remember my mom got it because it was Sonic and I loved Sonic. And well, sure. Some of the people that I'm I've been occasionally in touch with from grade school. They remember me as liking Sonic. The Sonic and I draw girl. Sonic all the time. Yeah. And the, my blue marker would always run out of ink before any of the other Right, colors. right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I had Sonic. Loved it. Um, you know, probably I like two and three. Mm -hmm. Sonic and Knuckles. Sonic Spinball. Loved that one. I've got a Sonic-related question for you since yeah. you seem to be a Sonic fan girl. <laughs> uh, who's your favorite Sonic sidekick? Oh. Hmm. I feel like the, the the obvious answer would be tails, but there are really a lot of them. Right. If you say Rouge the Bat, I'm gonna have to slap. You. Right. No. <laughs> I probably you, you know tails. He can fly Sonic places. He it's can. So much fun That's in the co-op. Also, uh, secondary question: being that you are a female, were you a little bit jealous when Sonic got a girlfriend? No. Does, doesn't he have like a pink girlfriend? Amy, Amy. Rose. Yeah. yeah. No, not at all. No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> You don't have any counter-transference going on there? Like, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway. Um, so, yeah, I played, uh, played on the Genesis and then um, got into PlayStation. Mm -hmm. um, so, had the first one and the second one. And I had the second one for the longest time. I only recently got the Xbox 360, made the upgrade two years ago. Um, because I thought when I upgraded the system, I would just get a PS3 because sure. I played the PlayStation for so long. Sure. And I love Ratchet and Clank. Love those Good games. Good games. Great games. Yeah. Um, and then um, I was introduced to Modern Warfare 2. Uh oh. <laughs> and it. I realized it's on both platforms. But then I occasionally played Halo here and there. Mm -hmm. And I knew that Halo was only on the 360. So I thought, well, huh. Good now I'm kind of leaning toward the, the 360. <laughs> And then everyone I knew at the time had a 360. I didn't know anyone with a PS3. Right. So I thought, well, there you go, 360 it is. So yeah. Best purchase I ever made. <laughs> so best good. day of your life. Yeah. <laughs> Some day to tell your kids. Yeah. There you go. That's awesome. So we have, uh, so we have some other gaming-related news from Greg. Oh, yes. So on a more, I guess... Real world. On a serious note. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. So, for those of you that haven't heard, I'm getting this via GameInformer.com. Um, but there was a, a bill that just passed in New York that bans uh, sex offenders from playing online. Uh, that they have to register, obviously, with the state, you know. Uh, but any kind of gaming-related account that they have with certain companies and Microsoft, Sony, Apple, Blizzard, EA, Disney, Warner Brothers, all those guys are on board. Hmm. Uh, they just get banned immediately. There's no questions asked. So I'm curious what my fellow podcast mates think of this story. So, Mike? Um, well, I'll tell you right now. Uh, I have 97 people on my Xbox friend list. Good God. And judging... Judging by the voices that come through uh, the speakers half the time, that's probably going to kill half my <laughs> friends list. <laughs> Most of them I haven't met, but they certainly sound like truckers at the very least, and maybe sex offenders. So I'm just going to say I'm against this. No, I mean, it's for serious, though. I mean, if they... Here's the thing. I mean, to me, the reality of it is uh, there are way too many kids that get online uh, without their parents' permission, or with their parents' oh, permission, definitely. and maybe the parents shouldn't be giving it in the first place. And I guess that's a, a bigger discussion to have. But you know, they're going to get online, and if these people are, are are really, you know, they're convicted, they have been found to, to to be, you know, to obviously be dangerous to kids. Then I mean, sorry, buddy, like maybe you should have thought of that before you, you know, did whatever you did. You know, mm -hmm. um, it is. I mean, it's getting to be more and more a privilege. Like this. Gaming used to be such a like fringe hobby and for only a, a subset of the population. But if you look at it now, I mean, from casual gaming on the on the iOS platforms, 
you know, to P PC gaming through Steam where people can buy a million games a second for 10 bucks, you know, to, to the massive, uh, you know, numbers of people playing Xbox and, and PS3, you know, it's, it's here and it's here to stay, you know, and, and we're going to have to treat it like something that affects the whole global community and not just the subset of people that can kind of police everything themselves anymore. It's, I think it's bigger than that. So, you know, that's one of the, I mean, if, you know, it's just like you don't let them near schools anymore. Like, don't let them where kids can be and, and kids mm -hmm. are going to be online. So I think that's what they got to do, you know. Andrea, what do you think? Um, I think, you know, I think it's a, it's a good precaution. I think it'll help. Um, now, you said this was just New York. Do you know any other states that are doing this? Um, the story, if I remember correctly, did not say anything about other states. Mm -hmm. okay. So I'm pretty sure this is just New York. Okay. I mean, I, I'm on board with it. I think it's a good idea. I think um, that the other states should get on board with it, too. You know, I think what they should do is they should find a way to, like, to police parents who don't want to parent their kids. Because, you know, yeah. I'll tell you something that, <laughs> well, I'll, t I'll tell you something that really does make me mad about, about gaming and, and censorship and, and keeping certain people offline and things like that is, you know, like I said at the beginning of the podcast, like, I'm the oldest one of us here. Like, I'm not super old, but I'm like 32. And, and, and you know, so I'm an adult. I've been an adult for a very long time. And I, and I, I completely uh, disagree with uh, any kind of um, artistic censorship. I think that games makers should, if they're making games for adults, they should be able to put in whatever content they want and they should stop trying to make this about like the gamer being the bad guy all the time, which is what a lot of these proposed laws about like getting rid of mature ratings or like making it a c tremendous crime if a, if a game, if a, like a GameStop like accidentally sells something to someone that, that, that turns out to be underage or like whatever. You shouldn't, you shouldn't, uh, you know, make the gamer the bad guy. You know, and and the fact of the matter is, gamers have grown up. Like the gener, like my generation grew up with these games. We're not giving them up. You know, we're in our thirties and we're going into our forties. We're going into our fifties. We're going to keep playing these games. We want entertainment that is geared towards adults. Mm -hmm. So that should be out there. You know, and parents really need to like just be educated that this is not a thing for the nerdy uncle that plays D and D like in his basement. Like this is a, a a thing that all of us do now. Everyone of every age has a game that is appropriate for them. And the parents have to realize that most of the things that are big sellers now are for adults because adults grew up playing these games. Now adults have the money to buy them mm -hmm. on their own. You know, that's what I am mad about. Let's get all the 14-year-olds off of my Call of Duty yeah. server so they can stop, you know, swearing at me. It's true. It's I'm true. amazed how they get it because um, just recently when I went to GameStop to buy uh, Mass Effect 2 and 3, they right. actually carded me. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You must look like you were eight. I guess so. So, you know, I mean, great if they do that, if that's standard. I don't know. I was surprised. Right. But, right, <laughs> okay, right. sure. Right, absolutely. So I think that we're gonna we're gonna uh, wrap it up in a few minutes here. But um, before we do that, uh, let's talk about maybe just for a second what what do you expect to be playing in the next week or so until we meet again, and uh, what are you looking forward to in, in in gaming maybe over the next like five to seven days, uh, Andrea. Go. I thought you were going to say five to seven years. Five to seven years. <laughs> gonna, let's project really what's going to happen. Um, uh, for me, all about Mass Effect. Going to play through yeah. Mass Effect 2. Um, yeah. Maybe start three. Who knows? <laughs> so Andrea's friend, Femme Shep, is going to be tearing through the galaxy. Yeah. Like, all due space. haste. It's true. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be playing Mass Effect 3 on Insanity. Yeah. Oh, As mentioned, I am an achievement whore. So yes. I like 100% <laughs> that game. Um, and then, like I mentioned earlier, I also like to play through Skyward Sword. Oh yeah. Um, and after that, a uh, game I never got around to was Rayman Origins. Ooh. Um, when that came out back in November. Right. So I'd like to I'd like to give that a spin, I think. Right. Awesome. Yeah, that was looking good. Uh, I am going to play uh, as much Mass Effect 3 multiplayer as I can because they got another bonus XP going on and they got the free pack coming out this week and I want to desperately earn the Geth Infiltrator because <laughs> Geth are the coolest creatures ever invented in video games. So I'm going to be playing some of that. I'm getting back into Battlefield 3. I really, really like the, the patch, uh, the new patch that came out, so I'm playing a, lot, a load of that. 
and I'll probably uh, level up my Skyrim character so I can keep up with my wife, who is uh, <laughs> is quickly approaching my level, and I cannot let that happen. Uh, so um, I, I think what well, by the time you hear this, or most of you hear this, we'll probably have a Facebook page up, and, and we might get a Twitter and things like that going. So I hope you liked uh, our inaugural episode. You should like us everywhere you can. You should reach out to us, and uh, we will keep bringing you uh, gaming news and uh, and opinions, and I uh, hope that you uh, continue to enjoy it. So for Andrea and Greg, this is Michael Mara, and we are the Moo Clan, and we are signing off. Sayonara, Moo!